It's Lisa from Been There, Got Out, and now we are going on live for real with Dr. Kurt, who I met in real life uh, maybe like a month ago. And um, I thought, of course, like a lot of people I meet, like, I'm going to interview him because he is connected to things that our clients really need help with. And one of those things, and let me see if he just joined, is... Um, Complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Let's see if you're here, Kurt. I don't see you yet. Hopefully you'll come on any second. Um, so anyway, because I'm Chris and I are high conflict divorce coaches, we deal with the most extreme cases. And so our clients are often dealing with a lot of health issues related to the stress that they've experienced in the legal system and also dealing with a toxic ex on a regular basis. So Dr. Kurt is a his background is as a chiropractor, but he's um he's does a lot of stuff with other areas. He does a lot of stuff with other kinds of medicine. I think the first time I met him, he was talking about how there's only two parts of your body. Hi Kurt. Hi Dr. Kurt. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the first time I heard you speak, you were talking about two parts of your body that don't heal themselves. Is it like the hands and feet or something? Um the skull and the feet. The don't. skull and the feet. And what was it yep. about that? Uh every most other joints in the body can just themselves back into position. And your hands and your your skull and your feet are two that don't really adjust themselves back, you know, with yeah. proper movement. Like essentially, you can walk and readjust your whole body by walking correctly. Really. Your, and your skull need extra help. Yeah. Then so when I heard you say that, I was just telling um, some of our community that I heard you say it, and I thought I'm going to need to interview him about how the body reacts to stress because when we were first talking at length about this topic i was i was thinking that it should be called something like healing from the inside out how constant stress can be a killer and how um being a high conflict divorce coach we deal with the most extreme cases and their bodies are really affected by stress because almost all of them have either been diagnosed or have some kind of complex ptsd so um, before we even get into it, why don't you first formally introduce yourself, and then we'll get into some questions. All right. Um, so I'm Dr. Kurt Waples. I run Bluestone Health Group here in Stamford, Connecticut. And really the, the basic premise of the practice, you can sum it up, is we help people reach the top 10% of their, of their health, which requires a different approach than standard medicine. We, uh, you know, we kind of focus on lifestyle medicine which has a lot of detox a lot of nutrients uh, use hormone function in the body we have kind of a unique way of assessing the body we look at fat muscle frame fluid fluid distribution tissue health hormone function function via where fat is placed on the body so this is kind of how, how do what does that all that mean well when you look at someone they everyone has a unique shape and that shape can be correlated back to their hormones so we developed a system to really look at that and say what's going on with your hormones and then from there we order bloods and really deep dive into people's biochemistry and that that's how you got to get them better because biochemistry is the easiest thing to fix but it's really really difficult if you don't test for it or look for the right things and that that's what we do we we deep dive the physiology yeah and, and so i know one of the things you said is that people have no idea what's going on with their bodies so why does that matter and like i said keep in mind that the people in this audience are probably dealing with tremendous stress and all the hormones associated with that yeah i, th I thought about this this one a lot when you sent it over and i always thought um well how how can you regulate your emotions if you can't regulate your muscles so when you're not in touch with your body i always kind of equate in humans, we're unique. We have our soul and our human body are intertwined into one being. And if you are disconnected from your soul, how are you supposed to heal? So I kind of tend to think of it that way is you need to feel your body. We want to feel our body. We have to move with our body. And using your body can actually be really therapeutic in the sense. But that's why, you know, when, when you get too far off into an, a, high, a high intensity emotional state, you do feel, I mean, there's a sense of feels out of body. 
on that. That is that is the case. We want to be back in the body and move through it and not avoid it. Yeah, I was thinking as part of my own healing, like years ago, especially when I was first getting out of my 20 year marriage relationship, I did a lot of exercising and I felt like the hormones that were produced then just got me, they really calmed me down, even though it was high intensity exercise. Is that what you mean? Like, is that something that can help people get more in touch with their bodies and feeling their bodies again, instead of just being in their heads all the time? Oh yeah, I, it's, it's, it's essentially shutting the brain off and reconnecting with the body. That's why nature is such a big thing because the nature actually has a grounding effect. It recharges your body similar to, I mean, you can also use a PEMF machine, but there's, there's a lot of ways of allowing, you know, call it the vibration of the universe to come back to you. You know, you want to, you want to get back to being inside your body and not out of it, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, that's really it, interesting because I, I think about just myself and all of the stuff that I still deal with and all of our clients deal with and our whole community is, deals with is we're always in our head and there's like this constant loop of like, this is so unfair and I don't have control over it. And I know that insomnia is really common, especially for me, me, even though I'm like years out of this relationship, I'm still heavily in the court system. And so I often will listen to a book on tape, like an audio book, um, in the middle of the night to get my brain, like if I'm in my brain, if my brain is going, I can't ever get back to sleep. So it's like, I need something else to t get my brain out of that loop so that mm -hmm. I can go back to sleep. And it's not, it's not the same thing because you're talking about with your body, but um, it's similar that I just have to get away from my brain. Well, I, we could circle back to that as uh, I always explain to, to clients, we have to view the body in three, three distinct ways. And then you can picture it like a triangle. We have our mental health, which that's what, when we say stress, that's what most people are thinking about. They're thinking about the thoughts, the mental, the mental, you know, the mental part of component of stress, the anxiety of stress. But we also have a biochemistry component. That's your hormones. That's the inside of the body. That's heart health. That's um, nutrient status. That's detox. That's liver. That's, you know, fluid intake and things like that. And then we also have lifestyle. You know, as we know, a lot of times, especially going through a divorce, lifestyle tends to get a little shaky. You know, you're not waking up at the same time. Part of that is you're not sleeping very well. And then it starts to, you know, roll into unhealthier habits over and over again. And, and in some cases, you know, substance abuse, you know, we start looking to calm. But if we come back to that biochemistry piece, a lot of time what goes hand in hand with anxiety is GABA depletion, which GABA is the only calming neurotransmitter in the body. So that means it, is the only I kind of equated to the break. GABA slows your thoughts down. It also what is, has powerful yeah, what is a neurotransmitter exactly? Like I'm trying Neuro to I always want to picture something. So what is GABA? A neurotransmitter is kind of similar to what a hormone is to the body. It tells your body what to do. It, okay. it, it tells it to have a certain response. And neurotransmitters are brain chemicals. So in terms of GABA, it tells your brain to slow down and calm down. And a lot of people, when you get in these high stress states, they not only don't have any GABA, but they're also burned out of the nutrients needed to make GABA. So it becomes this catch 22 of you have no break, there is no GABA. And on the other side of it, you don't have the nutrients, even you know the ability to make GABA if you wanted to. And part of this is that's why um, there's a lot of drugs like Xanax would be a GABA supporting drug and that that's why a lot of times it gets so hard to go off of xanax because you're taking xanax in a deficiency state it's how it's releasing whatever little amount of gaba you have left in your body and but we didn't help the body replenish the gaba which is really easy it's b6 magnesium and taurine which is an amino acid really so it's, it's one of very very simple but if you don't do it it's one of those things we're not going to ever really replenish gaba without taking the nutrients and ironically magnesium gets depleted with stress it helps detox stress out of the body so as stress goes up we need more and more nutrients to help bring it back down so it's basically like because i was going to say what can we do and i expected this long complicated list of things to build the gaba again and you said it's basically taking b6 magnesium and did you say amino acids did i get that right Taurine, yeah. Taurine is an amino acid. Okay. All right. 
Interesting. So when people are extremely stressed, they should be taking supplements. Yeah. We have to remember back to that triangle of health. I always tell people biochemistry is the easiest part of that triangle to help. But if we don't test for it or have a method or, you know, look into it as to what's going to be the most powerful impact of that biochemistry piece, we're never going to know because we can guess, but doing real testing, kind of figuring that out, we can, we can really dive in and hit the things that impact you personally the, the most. So that's, that was some, that's the easiest part of the puzzle to fix, but we have to test for it to fix it. Lifestyle becomes a lot easier when your brain works. So when you can, you know, think of it, when you can slow down those rushing stress thoughts, it makes it a whole lot easier to get up and go to the gym and do some of those healthy things you know are going to help your body process through, you know, and, and kind of get over some of these and get your body back into a routine, a healthy routine instead of a high anxiety, massive stress routine of my life is over, my life is changing, what about, you know, what about my kids? You know, what, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna live? You know, no, we can just focus on, you have a workout class at 9.30, let's get there. You know, <laughs> let, let's, just, let's just go make it, make it through that hour and then we can worry, you know, think about what 10.30 to 11.30 does, you know, type of thing. Yeah, so somebody's asking if they're not near your office how they can test, but let's hold that till the end because I'm going to ask you at the end how people can get to you. So just mm -hmm. remind me to say that. Um, okay, so another thing is, you, I know you had done a whole video on the importance of breathing, and I noticed that like when we do Zooms with our clients and in our legal abuse support group, you can see people visibly holding their breath. And one of our clients um, who's been with us for a few months she always used to hold her breath. She had a big victory in court recently, and she said this past week, I feel like I can finally breathe again. So can you talk about the importance of breathing here too? Um, well, simply, it's very important. <laughs> you should try to breathe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, what, what we see is, what do, people, what do you do when you're stressed? You hold your breath. And uh, I always thought that the, one of the most interesting things I ever read on breath was when they, they interviewed a bunch of Navy SEALs and asked them what's the first thing they do in a high stress circumstance in war. And they said, breathe. Breathing, deep breathing, calms the nervous system down. So it, it is the easiest thing to do to calm down. But it also is the hardest because you don't think about it. You, you don't think of breathing as an active uh, activity. But it is active. We I train people to breathe every single day. Um, and what happens in these high stress states is not only does it become hard to breathe just from the normal stress response of kind of blocking in and holding your breath a little bit, but then your muscles get stiff and your ribs get stiff and your diaphragm, which is a muscle, gets very, very stiff. And then it becomes almost impossible to deep breathe because all of your structure is so locked in place, you can't breathe. So I found to kind of help people breathe, we focus on the structural side. We loosen the ribs, we get the diaphragm moving, we have them do some fascia work, which sometimes can be a little painful, but that bringing the body up a little bit in that pain tells your body where to heal. I always think we use pain strategically. Oh, really? That's it. What is fascia? What is fascia work? Fascia, think of it as the saran wrap that holds your body together. So, um, you know, think of, you have your, your quad, which is a bunch of different muscles, four different muscles on the front of your quad. Well, what holds all those muscles together? You know, think of them as just wrapped up in fascia. I mean, fascia gets complex. Some, you know, some physiologists watching this might be like, but it's a liquid, you know, it's kind of, think of it as just kind of the substance in your body that holds it all together. Mm -hmm. So that substance holding your body together is just all locked up and not moving. Well, we got to loosen that up. Yeah, it's interesting that you said you train people to breathe because I know people always say when you're dealing with stress and just in general, it's good to meditate. I personally am really bad at um, unguided meditation. I, I always need someone to sort of like tell me what to do and then I'm great, but but I can't just do it on my own. Do you find that it's, that it's helpful for your clients also to have that sort of guided, structured learning to breathe and do they... How long does it take for them to learn how to breathe on your, their own in an active way? Um, it can get as complex as using devices to help people breathe and train breathing. I found the most effective 
tool for people is to 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 do use Wim Hof breathing, which What's he's that? a Wim Hof is kind of a wild Dutchman that you know sits in ice and has a breathing pattern. But I found his his stuff it's um, very easy to do. It trains the body to really breathe and move your diaphragm. And it and it almost becomes meditative and very easy because it's active. You do it, you know. It's a uh, thirty breaths in and out, really, really fast, and then holding your breath out and doing different things. So it's this active thing, but it takes time to do it. And I found that is one of the most effective ways to get people to start breathing because it forces your your structure to move, and it's active. And it you know, there's no getting stuck in your mind with sometimes the slow yoga, meditative breathing you know, your mind just starts going wild and it's like, well, this That's didn't, what, what am I supposed to do now? Right. So, so sometimes it's easy to have this active style of almost like an exercise to train the breath back. So I found that, that seems to be, you know, the fast and furious, easy kind of method of getting into it. And there's a whole community over there too, that gets really, really into breathing. So it, it kind of can turn into whatever it works, but we've had one woman increase her uh, lung capacity when she came in you know she's not that stressed of a lady but only 1.8 liters of lung capacity very very low and lung capacity of course is related to your longevity it's a direct indicator of your health and how long you're going to live she increased it by three liters of air wow. so just getting it's not like her lungs grew but the structure and her diaphragm begin to move, began to move and then she was able to breathe and use her lungs again. So it was, so that that's what I found is the most effective strategy. You know, the easiest thing you could do today. I mean, I think he has an app. You can go download his app or go to YouTube and just see it and say, okay, I'm just going to do it. And he's, ah. he's kind of fun because he'll tell you to do it. You know, just Wait, breathe. You Wim Hof, that's his name? Wim, Wim Hof, yeah. How do you spell that? W-I-M-H-O-F. Okay, I was spelling it wrong. Okay. Um, somebody was saying that cold showers help them. Does that have anything to do with breathing or being more I, in touch with your body? I don't want to take a cold shower, but if I have to, I will. Oh, I, I mean, I've, I, <laughs> I haven't taken a warm shower in probably two years, but, uh, uh, but w the cold showers are interesting because they, they not only help with blood flow and things, but it also, I, I think of it, it, it trains your stress resiliency. It's a, it's a minor stressor. I don't even like to use the word stressor with it. It's just, it's just a minor annoyance. Cold water when you don't want to be cold. Eh, it's, okay. it's annoying. But think of, you train your body to start dealing with these little annoyances. So, you know, these little things just roll off your shoulder because you, you've essentially trained for it. These are, these are just annoyances. Oh, That's an interesting you know, not, way to think about building resilience, too. Yeah. So it's Physical little. As we're well training. As kind of the s same thing as weightlifting. Mm -hmm. you know? Getting stronger, we're creating a little bit of damage to build the body. The body's always repairing and getting stronger. So it's what are we going to get through? And even think of, you know, in, in terms of a divorce and a very, very heavy mental load, mental stressor, you're going to get through it. And the more you kind of create little resiliencies and train your body that way, the more these big ones, you're ready for it. Your body's ready. It's not as a big of a shock to the system. Oh, when yeah, you, I love that. Um, okay, so speaking of that, with divorce and high conflict situations, especially in the legal system, um, we, you and I had talked about adrenaline and how it affects the body. And, you know, we, a, a lot of us are in survival mode, but then the adrenaline runs out. And so you said that when the adrenaline burns out is when you start to feel the pain. So what kinds of health issues do you find a lot of people experience when that adrenaline runs out from either a short or long-term survival mode? Uh, well, I think first, first with stress, we have to kind of approach stress in a, in a different way um, because we have uh, more than one type of stress hormone in the body. And I always kind of, to keep it simple, say we have cortisol, which is the traditional stress hormone. And I always say, think of cortisol as being good. We want good cortisol. That it's healthy. It helps our immune system. It's anti-inflammatory. So we want perfect, ideal 24-hour rhythms of cortisol. 
when that cortisol starts to burn out, when our adrenals are getting stressed, or when it's just pumping out too much too often, and for example, in a divorce state, our body is going to maintain a certain level of quote unquote stress hormones in the body. So when the good stuff runs out, we flip over into adrenaline. And adrenaline does not care about tomorrow. So it's burning you out. It's rocking your heart rate up. It's rocking up your blood pressure. It's leading to higher inflammation. It's burning your brain out, kind of like too much coffee does. It's just making it fire all day long. So it might feel really good in the beginning, but over time, your body, it just leaves your body kind of like, you know, worn, torn Poland after World War II. You know, it burned it out, blasted through it. And now at the end of the stressor, when you can finally breathe, when the brain can breathe, your heart can finally breathe again. There's nothing left of the body. You have a worn, torn body now because that adrenaline's just been ripping through, not caring about tomorrow. So that's where a lot of times we have to help people pick up the pieces and rebuild their body because they just were flying zero to 100 for the last usually couple of years by that point. So that does that answer your question a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking too um, of the like an analogy with I just did a blog about this about an abusive relationship. It's almost like people think, okay, you got away, so now you're gonna be better. You're gonna feel better because you're physically away. But in my blog, I wrote how with emotional abuse, the abuser's voice is still in your head, so it's not so easy to detach. But what I'm thinking about as you're talking is it's not just someone's voice in your head, but your body still has taken this, uh-oh. Sorry, can you still hear me? I just started getting off. Okay. So it's, it's also that your bo- there's a physical toll on your body so that even after you've left this relationship, you still need to build your body back. It's not like I'm free, I'm fine. And I think a lot of our clients also get impatient because they'll be like, it's been a few months, like I've been doing everything right, but I still feel terrible or I'm still really sick. We have, we have a number of clients who have had cancer. Now, luckily, those who have been out for a while and away from that initial stress have started recovering, which is wonderful and fingers crossed that it stays that way. But that war-torn body, we, we see a lot of that. We see a lot of people who have long-term physical effects even after they've gotten out of these difficult situations and relationships. Well, it's, it's also kind of similar to that GABA analogy. Whereas if biochemistry is very easy to fix, but if you don't ever test for it, we don't know how deep the problem is. And for example, especially in these stress cases, what, we're, what we see is that we measure, we, use, we test cortisol in the office. So we test for it. And a lot of times we see it's really low, maybe 20% of what it should be, which means when we see cortisol that low, it tells us you're living on adrenaline. And the other side of adrenaline, it's, it's very addictive. You're, there's really? nothing like rush of adrenaline. Adrenaline feels cool. It's kind of like if anyone, you know, has ever done cocaine, you know, poof, your brain lights up, you know, dop- a dopamine rush is very, very exciting. It's better than a slow, steady dopamine, which is healthy. So mm-hmm. I always view it's kind of like, you know, kind of like a rush of cocaine or, you know, a double shot of espresso. It, it, it really riles the body up and feels amazing while it's there in the body. It just doesn't care about tomorrow. So that, that the cells in the body feel physically kind of get addicted to that stress response where you almost start telling yourself, oh, I, I can't do anything if I'm not ramped up. And you're like, you know, you don't have to be ramped up to take to soccer practice. No, that's okay. You don't, you don't need, you don't need 46 ounces of coffee to go do that. You can, you can relax and do. So a lot of times it's helping the people understand that, that anxiety ridden life, that, that feeling that they've just been driving so hard and they almost think it almost a lot of people wear it as a badge of honor over time to say oh I, I can get so much we have to almost start calming it back down so it, it's that those stress cases take a they take a long time because it's there's that huge mental component there's a huge biochemistry component and when stress is involved it takes a long time to retrain the body to to use the good stuff and not kind of almost rely on that that drug-like adrenaline feeling. You know, this is so fascinating because I see a lot of parallels between um, abusive relationship dynamics and what you're describing. So for example, I interviewed a 
a therapist a few weeks ago, and he was talking about how trauma bonding is as addictive as a heroin addiction. And I think a lot of that too, in the day to day, like when relationships end, these toxic relationships that our clients deal with, the other person still engages with them. And it's almost like they can't help engaging. And I'm wondering if a lot of it is because their brain's so used to all that drama and activity that they, they can't stop. And so we also have to try to separate them and say, don't do a near jerk reaction. Don't keep engaging, like sl slow everything down. It just sounds really, really similar with the body and the brain. Um, what do you think? You always say, what, what's the biochemical component of that addiction? Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that, that feeling of that rush of stress and adrenaline coming into your body. You don't realize how much your body wants that. The body yeah. wants to feel that. And then, and then it, the brain is very tricky. You know, it'll start equating that with love and caring. And it's like, no, 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 that's adrenaline pumping. That's, that's not love, you know, that's, you know. So starting to piece those pieces together, those feelings, bringing it back to that first question of why does your body matter? Because we, if we can start equating some of those body feelings you're having, you could start saying, oh, th that's not a feeling I want, you know. That, well, that's perfect right. for, again, you've heard the, the thing about it's love at first sight. And that I've read that it's not, when you, when you start feeling all excited when you see someone for the first time, that it's really adrenaline in your body that's saying this is familiar and you should be worried about it if it's that intense. Mm. Have you heard that? that Maybe, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I haven't yeah. heard that specifically. I don't, yeah. I don't do a, a lot of uh, reading on love at first sight currently. <laughs> Yeah. And the other thing was um, when we were just talking about the engagement and all the drama and your body wants it and your brain wants it, that um, a lot of times our people, when they're, when they are not fighting with the person, they don't really know what to do with themselves because it's a totally different dynamic because they're used to being in that survival mode. It's almost mm -hmm. like they get, they get bored and it, it doesn't, it feels uncomfortable to not mm -hmm. be so dramatic and involved. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's so really same, interesting. same exact, you know, same exact feeling. That's it, without realizing it, you don't realize it's it, the adrenaline piece of it is very, very. Addicting. I mean, that's why I think I'm, over 90% of doctor's visits are stress related because the, these are the components of stress that, that, you know, we don't really think about. We're just like, oh, stress related. You no, know, but it's like, no, these, this is a big, this is part of it. That these are those stress related issues. And that's why, you know, mental health is so important. And I think also, you know, we have to start approaching biochemistry, you know, hormones and body, you know, body comp and other things, almost in that same light, because they're so intimately related that, yeah. you know, we, it's really hard to change your mental thoughts without changing your brain chemistry. Yeah, they, work, they work synergistically together. Yeah. Um, so then I was going to say, we, you, another thing that you talked about that I thought was really interesting is how you can measure stress by your muscle. Like you can, you can actually see it. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Um, well, first you have to measure it. So we have, <laughs> <laughs> so I have a, a, we go in the office, we use bio impedance analysis, which is a, is a way of, basically measuring the electricity of the body. With those measurements, we can get fat and muscle and frame and fluid, and tissue health. So we have to be able, step one is we have to be able to um, look at muscle. And for women, our stress cutoff, so when I keep saying, you know, that biochemical, where your body is physically in stress is when you're under 31% muscle. So we measure it and we see, and then the cool thing with these is once we measure a few times, we can start seeing the, the weekly or monthly fluctuations in fat and muscle. And I have an easy saying to remember this is stress eats muscle. So back to that adrenaline state, that high stress state, your body flips and you're using muscle mass as your energy source. And I always say stress requires a lot of energy to keep going which is why it's so fatiguing, which is why a lot of people overeat because it requires a ton of energy to feed that stress response. So we measure stress directly by looking at, um, looking at muscle mass and then and, over and time. So, but it's, it eats muscle, but did you also say it preserves fat? 
Yeah. So think of uh, being anabolic or catabolic would be kind of the, the muscle building terms. But an anabolic state is a calm state, and that's when your body's building muscle, and then it's using fat for its energy source. The body likes using fat for energy. That's its optimal state is fat is your energy source. But in stress, sugar becomes your energy source. And where does that sugar come from? It comes from your muscle. So it's when that state, you're flooding your body with extra sugar. You're breaking down your muscle to make sugar. But then also, when you're burning sugar, you're not burning fat. So you're actually saving your fat for when you calm back down. But then we think, how many of us get stuck in these chronic, chronic high stress states where you're never burning fat because you're never out of stress? This is, this is absolutely fascinating. And I'm thinking back to years ago when, because I was always like fairly uh, thin and then those couple of years after the divorce, I was working out all the time because I was keeping my mind off this. And I went to the doctor and my, my primary care was like, you're actually on the verge of being overweight. And I'm like, how is that possible? Like, how could I be overweight? But this makes perfect sense now. And this is also, you know, the, a lot of people, you know, in the wellness community on Instagram, and there's always bickerings of, you know, calories in, calories out, just lower your calories and you'll lose weight. This type of stuff in extreme stress, it almost becomes impossible to lose weight. And yeah. this is the, cause you, you're literally everything in your being is saying to store fat and burn muscle. So it, it is, you know, the more extreme the stress, the harder it does, it becomes to lose weight. Wow. Okay, so um, so you said that in order to figure out what's not working and fix it, you have to measure it. <clears throat> and then um, you mentioned at the beginning of this about getting to the top 10% of your health. So talk a little bit about what people can do once they figure out what it is and they can start working on it, how do they, how do they get there? Um, step one is measuring. We got it. We got it. We got to have the numbers and know what we're trying to do to get to the top 10%. And how I kind of equate it is everyone can get to about the top 30%. That's pretty easy. And, um, that's kind of also that top 30% where prescription drugs kind of play a role. Um, so like if your blood pressure is high, you know, or other things, there's prescription drugs to help that. Once you get up to about the top 20 top 15 percent of health that's when we find it, it's in very interesting prescriptions tend to not work very well so the healthier you get the less drug care you need and the more call it nutrient care you need and that's where to get to that top 10 percent does require supplementation and i would say it requires custom supplementation specifically for you because everyone can take some vitamins but if you're just taking random vitamins it may not really help you which is most people's you know, experience with vitamins. Yeah. Oh, I got this. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it worked. And I went to see, you know, wherever. And, but no, when we when we customize it to you, you feel it. You're like, oh, my, my brain is on point. It is rocking today. Or my bowels are working like they never have. I don't have that occasional constipation or stool, you know, or, or my energy. I'm not dipping at two o'clock every day anymore. It's just very steady and smooth. So that's the beauty of getting people to the top 10%. It's really ironing out all those things everyone already knows what to do, but just making it for you, which people need that. Everyone's different. So it, that's what. So, okay. So then there's other things like getting enough sleep. So if you're all balanced out, will that help your sleep? Well, that would be the, the side of the triangle, the lifestyle side. Okay. So the lifestyle, yes, sleep, sleep, hugely important. When, you know, when's the only time you recover when you're sleeping? Right. So we have to sleep right. And I am a big proponent of tracking people's sleep. I mean, we need to get REM sleep. We need to get deep sleep. We need to have the right proportions of light sleep. We need to not be waking up throughout the night. Um, and the, you know, a lot of uh, one interesting tidbit that people don't think about when you're waking up to pee, it means you're not getting deep sleep. Really? You should sleep through the entire night, no matter how much water you're drinking. Yes, don't drink a gallon of water an hour before bed. But also, if you're getting deep enough sleep, your kidneys shut down. You don't have to pee. So if you're waking up to pee at night, you are not getting good sleep, which wow. is usually pretty mind-blowing for people. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that's an interesting one. And then also part of sleeping is also being awake. And when you have sluggish thyroid function, you don't have good energy during the day and you don't sleep very well at night. It's kind of like leaving your car idling all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it never cools off. It's going to start overheating. It's going to burn out. That's exactly what happens to people when they don't sleep and they don't wake up and have the energy. So it's, it's really getting a lot of those things optimized. Um, you know, and most people know, quote unquote, the healthy foods, the right. you know, exercise is good. So, so lifestyle side is actually really pretty easy. A lot of times it's just tweaking it up and redefining what some of those healthy things mean. Like for sleep, you know, not waking up at all during the night is, is better sleep than waking up during the night. So we, so we kind of touch on those things and kind of tweak them back up. And it's different for everyone. Yeah, it's fascinating. Okay, what about the significance of two years? You had said something when we talked before about two years. So in reference to two years, it was, um, and this also kind of touches on the, the yo-yo, why people lose weight and gain weight or mm -hmm. you know, calm down and then immediately ramp back their stress back up because you can yo-yo with your stress response as well. Two years, that's about how long it takes to establish your new normal. So think of, you know, even for example, when you were divorced, when it kind of the main part of it ended, how long did it take to feel normal again? Well, for me, if you're asking, if that's not a rhetorical question, I don't feel normal again because I'm still in court. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Eight years later. So for a lot of people, once, once it kind of finishes, you know, it takes, it takes about a year and a half to two years to kind of be like, okay, my new life is now going forward. Yeah. And kids notice this, you know, because if they switch schools, it takes a full year for the kids to really begin to assimilate into the new school. Um, so when we say when, when you reach your goal of health, that's when the two year timetable starts. Because now it's your prerogative to maintain those changes you just had for two full years. You need to train your body now to make that new state your normal, which is the big, you know, one of the big issues with dieting and other things is people reach their goal and say, my goal's done. It's like, no, that, that's when the timetable starts mm -hmm. because now you, you maintain all those changes for two years, your body's different. Yeah. And it that, makes, it makes really sense. What we see. Yeah. Okay. So you talked about the two years, you talked about the yo-yo and I'm just thinking there's never anything that's, that's fast and easy. You know, no. just like what you're talking about, it's, it's a long-term commitment to your health. And once it's going to take time to even get to that top 10%, and then you need to maintain it for at least two years. It's almost like establishing brand new habits and getting through the transi mm -hmm. transition and just staying there. Um, and I'm thinking too, with our people, they're like, when can I, when is this going to be over? Like, when can I be done? And when is it? but it's never easy and it's never done quickly. So even if someone sees you, I mean, how long does like testing take even before people can start supplementing and doing all the stuff they need to, to get to that top 10%? A week. A week? Oh, yeah. That's we, that's have, we, have a, we, we have about an, the first visit's about an hour in the office mm -hmm. and then we order blood work and blood work takes about a week to come back. And then from there, we're good to go. We have our plan, we have our outline, we have our check-in points. You know, we create kind of a whole, a whole outline of a plan because some things change slow, some things change fast. And we gotta be able to track and measure, you know, we have short-term goals, long-term goals, medium goals, and we wanna make sure everything's moving properly along the way. Um, yeah. So relatively, relatively pretty fast. That's great. All right. So before someone had asked um, how how they can find you, and that was going to be my last question for you anyway. So I know, Kurt, you, you're in Stamford, Connecticut, near me, um, and occasionally you do telehealth. But if someone's not local, because most of our people watching this are not local at all, but how can they either find you or are there things like you that exist in other places? Like, what do you recommend? Because I had never, before I talked to you, I'd never heard of anything like this. Um, well, a lot of it I put together myself. So we, we are very, we're, we're pretty unique in what we do. Mm -hmm. um, 
for some people, I mean, we can do stuff online. You know, we just we just mi we just miss some of the in office measurements. But you know, a lot of it we can learn a lot from blood. We can learn a lot from you know neurotransmitter questionnaires and different things. And a lot of times, it's not that hard. You know, to to kind of help people, you can you get a really good gauge of what's going on with them and what can really help them move forward. And there's functional medicine docs all over the you know all over the country. They all work a little differently in different things, but you know. If someone really wants some help, we, we'd be able to find something for them. Okay, so with, can you tell people me, how to find how to find you specifically? And of course, I'll post your Instagram handle on our um, on our site with this recording. Um, so I have our the our clinic site is bluestonehealthgroup.com. Exactly how it sounds, Bluestone Health Group, and that's the name of the the business. Um, and then I also have a personal kind of info website, askdrkirk.com which is the same as the hand, the Instagram handle. Um, okay. Those, I mean, you, you, you could probably Google my name too and it'd pop up, but yeah. um, not right. too hard. Great, so is there anything else that we forgot to talk about? Mm, I don't think, I don't think we missed anything. I just hope, I mean, I hope some people kind of begin to understand a little bit that, you know, the the mental stuff that they're really feeling is, you know, we can almost kind of approach it from a different side really tackle that biochemistry piece and kind of take the edge off, you know, and, and give the brain a little, you know, a little bit more room to breathe and begin to process because living every day, you know, in, in max stress does not allow you to, you know, move through. It just allows you to survive. Yeah. Super, super helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Kurt. I'm so glad that I got you on and I'll probably get you back again sometime. All righty. All right. Be I'll see you later. Bye.